If you're watching this, it's probably because either your LP little A level came back high or someone you love has an elevated result and you have been searching and Google has made you a little bit anxious about this. So today we are going to go through exactly which parts of this risk is fixed, which parts are modifiable and how our current therapies, what we can do today fit together while we wait for the next generation of drugs. Hi, I'm Dr. Lily Johnston, board certified vascular surgeon and cardiometabolic health specialist on a mission to put myself out of business as a surgeon by detecting and treating vascular disease before you ever need that operation. Today, we are going to talk about the three big levers that we have to talk about our LP little a and the risk. Lever number one is our metabolic and inflammatory environment, which doesn't get talked about a lot for LP little a, but is relevant. Lever number two is our overall ApoB burden, or the total number of atherogenic plaque-forming particles that we have in circulation. And related is lever number three, which are the drugs and other treatments that are available to blunt the impact of both LP little a and ApoB. These are all things that we can do today to mitigate the risk of that particle circulating in our bloodstream. Okay, let's talk about the first lever we have, which is the environment in which LP little a circulates. Now, I just got done telling you that you cannot change your LP little a level with nutrition or exercise or sleep or breath work. It's, it's a fixed level. So why are we talking about metabolic health again? We are talking about it because there's actually some evidence that you can mitigate the risk of elevated LP little a with good metabolic health. And there's one study in particular that has shaped how I think about that. Thank you to Dr. Nick Norwitz for bringing this study to my attention. Because this is a, this is a large analysis from the MESA cohort. That's the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis. It's a very famous longitudinal group of patients that has been studied for many, many years. And as part of this analysis, they examined whether waist to hip ratio meaning the measurement of your waist versus the measurement of your hip, which is a reflection of visceral adiposity or fat accumulating around the abdominal organs, whether that modifies how much cardiovascular risk LP little a confers. And the key findings of that study were that in people who had elevated LP little a greater than that 50 milligrams per deciliter we talked about in part one, risk for plaque, ASCVD, was not significantly elevated in the patients who had the lowest waist-to-hip ratio, who were metabolically healthiest. However, risk did rise substantially in the third of patients with the highest waist-to-hip ratio, and they had about a 50% to 100 and so percent chain increase in risk of ASCVD. Now, this is an observational study. It was not randomized and it's not something we've seen replicated yet in other cohorts, but I think it's a signal really worth paying attention to. And it suggests that there is a lot we can do ourselves to modify that risk. And that's always a good thing. And it seems that this central adiposity or inflammatory visceral fat might play a role. And then you're asking, well, does that make sense? Why would that be the case? And in fact, there's some good biology that would actually help this make sense. One of the reasons that lipoprotein little a is particularly atherogenic or prone to forming plaque is that it carries a high burden of something called oxidized phospholipids, sometimes abbreviated OXPL. And these are very pro-inflammatory lipids, and they act as a danger signal in the arterial wall and create this trap that actually brings in more particles and creates the uh, environment for plaque to form and to continue to propagate. Oxidized phospholipids or these OxPL rich particles are more likely to trigger immune activation to promote plaque formation and contribute to plaque instability or the rupture events that actually lead to heart attacks and strokes. What causes more oxidation or more inflammatory stress? Well, we know visceral adiposity, insulin resistance, all contribute to oxidative stress and inflammation. Poor glycemic control, even smoking and other pro-oxidant states of toxic exposures. 
So even if your LPA number itself does not change as the result of improving your nutrition and exercising more, improving your metabolic health may reduce the inflammatory impact of those LPA particles that you have. In a patient who comes to me with high elevated LP little a, but is young and doesn't yet have any evidence of plaque, this is really the first place to start. It does not replace pharmacotherapy when medication is indicated, but it does always help to improve our metabolic health, reduce that visceral fat, and reduce our inflammation. But once plaque enters the picture, our strategy, of course, has to broaden. Here's where we start our lever number two. This is ApoB burden and particles. So you'll remember from our cholesterol video, particles that form plaque all have this ApoB molecule. So LDLC, but also triglycerides, the VLDL and IDL remnant particles, they all have this ApoB lipoprotein. And when we think about the overall risk, ApoB is the number that we use. So you are somebody whose metabolic house is in order. You have cleaned up your nutrition, you're exercising, you never smoked, but your dad had his first heart attack at 40 and you wanna know what else can be done to lower your risk. Let's talk about what we have now to change our outcomes. Because right today, we do not have approved therapies that specifically lower LP little a pharmacologically. Our first goal in patients with this risk factor is to just manage the overall ApoB particle burden and get that well below our usual risk threshold. So in other words, if you cannot move the needle on LPA specifically, what we can do is control all its slightly less miscreant cousins and clean up the neighborhood that way. And our first villain in that list, everybody's favorite, statins. So people are always concerned because there is a very real effect where statins modestly raise LP little a. The average increase is somewhere between 8 and 20%. That is real and it's not disputed, but two other things are also absolutely true. One, statins reduce cardiovascular events in people with high elevated LP little a, and the modest increase in LP little a related to the statin has not been shown to negate that benefit. So if you have elevated LPA and you've been told to be on a statin, this idea that statins are bad because they raise the LP little a confuses a lab problem with overall outcomes. The outcomes data do support the use of statin therapy and other LDL or ApoB lowering therapies to reduce the risk that is associated with the LPA. In practice, this LPA bump is a good reason to seek out additional therapy options, especially in high-risk patients, but you shouldn't avoid the statin just because it causes a small bump in the LP little a. Several of you are going to ask me about Zetia or Azetamibe. It is essentially neutral for LP little a, so it absolutely has a role in reducing ApoB synergistically with statins, I might add, but it has no significant effect on LPA itself. Perhaps the best tool we have in our arsenal currently today are the PCSK9 inhibitors. Because even though the statins are foundational, these drugs are even more powerful in reducing total ApoB burden, and they also will reduce LP little a. So PCSK9 inhibitors, these are monoclonal antibodies. They are delivered as an injection. The two that are available on the market are alirocumab or Praliwent and evolocumab or Repatha. There is a third option that inhibits PCSK9, but it's a small interfering RNA called enclycerin. All of these dramatically reduce ApoB and as a side bonus, they lower LPA by about 20 to 30%. So this makes PCSK9 inhibitors a favored target, especially in those with dramatically elevated LPA or a double hit problem like heterozygous FH or familial hypercholesterolemia and elevated LP little a. If you are a patient with established plaque on imaging or persistently elevated ApoB despite maximally tolerated statin therapy, PCSK9 inhibitors are something you should absolutely consider and look into. And again, most insurance will talk to you about whether you've been on maximally tolerated 
tolerated statin therapy? And if so, then PCS, PCSK9 inhibitors will likely be available to you. The next big thing people ask about is aspirin. Should everybody with elevated LP little a be on aspirin? And it's a great question. Um, and it's a very common therapeutic approach, but I think you have to be clear on what we're treating with it because it shows up in two very separate contexts and it's important not to confuse them. The first context is secondary prevention. Secondary prevention means somebody already has disease or they've had an event like a heart attack, a stroke, a stent of some kind. And for those patients, irrespective of the LP little a, aspirin or some other antiplatelet medication is absolutely indicated. It's just part of the secondary prevention protocol unless there's a specific reason that we can't be on it. But the more nuanced question is whether in patients who don't have plaque, who are just interested in primary or primordial prevention and have elevated LPA, should those patients be on an aspirin? We don't do that routinely, although many physicians have gotten uh, it in their head that that should be prescribed. But in fact, there are a subset of patients who do really well with aspirin and others who don't. This was determined in the women's health study. They did genetic analysis of different LPA variants, and they found that patients with a very specific single nucleotide polymorphism or SNP had a markedly different response to low-dose aspirin. Those patients had a substantial reduction in cardiovascular events, but it was not seen in non-carriers. And unfortunately, today we don't genotype patients with elevated LP little a. We don't know whether you are carrying that particular SNP that would make aspirin effective for you or not. At which point it becomes a conversation with you and your care team about what is your risk for bleeding, which is really the downside to aspirin, and what is your risk based on your LP little a values. At that point, it's the best we can do, and it's generally not a default recommendation, but it will benefit a certain subset of patients with elevated LP little a. All right. One more thing we should talk about is niacin. So this is actually a supplement. It's not even a prescription. It's also known as vitamin B3, and it's sort of old faithful. It's been around in the lipid treatment sphere for a very long time. It's actually been around longer than I have. And it's used in much higher doses than what you will find in a multivitamin. So you're not getting treatment with niacin if you're just taking a regular, you know, Centrum. Um, but if people are using this therapeutically, you can see a 20 to 40% reduction in LP little a. However, no trial to date has shown a mortality benefit of niacin above and beyond regular statin therapy. And it has some pretty significant side effects. People get flushing, it's an allergic type reaction, nausea. Um, it's, it's pretty dramatic for patients, uh, even with the, the longer extended release forms. And also it causes pretty profound insulin resistance, uh, can cause new onset diabetes and trouble with glycemic control. And some people get damage to the liver. They get elevation in their liver enzymes and uh, stiffness in the liver as well. So for most of the modern prevention community, niacin has fallen out of favor. There are a couple of exceptions who are still using it with, with um, they report good, Im good impact, but most of us have stopped using niacin uh, because we have so many other tools that are better tolerated. So bottom line for niacin, the labs look better, but outcomes don't. And we have quit using it for that reason, most of us. Okay, for the ladies in the room, menopausal hormone therapy. This kind of deserves its own lane, of course, because it's a specific population. Um, but you'll be pleased to know, if this is you, that multiple randomized trials and meta-analyses show that estrogen-containing menopausal hormone therapy will lower LP little a by 20 to 30%. Um, and this is, again, reflective of multiple studies. Now, this probably was reducing you back to baseline because there is an increase in all lipids, including LP little a, after the menopausal transition. Uh, but even so, you would just as soon not have that increase in risk and bring you back down at least to your baseline, if perhaps not even a little bit lower. Now, oral formulations of estrogen or estradiol will reduce LPA a bit more than the transdermal forms. Um, there is concern in the community about the risks of oral versus transdermal. Transdermal is still a great option and may be preferred in some women, depending on cardiovascular or especially thrombotic risk. 
Um, but you should never use menopausal hormone therapy for the sole purpose of reducing LP little a. And if you're a woman who has miserable hot flashes or joint pains and uh, other symptoms of menopause, and you're otherwise a good candidate, high LP little a is one more good reason to have a well-designed hormone replacement plan and not to white knuckle your way through menopause. The last thing we have that manages LPA specifically is not a drug, but it's actually a mechanical solution and it's called plasmapheresis. For most of you, you don't need to know about this, but if you or someone you love has really elevated lipoprotein little a levels and we're familiar with hypercholesterolemia, this is a really nice thing to know about if you need it. Lipoprotein apheresis is basically a special dialysis circuit. They'll take the blood out of the body, run it through a special cleaner that removes the ApoB particles and the LPA particles, and then it returns that blood to the patient. So as you might imagine, this is reserved for extreme cases, uh, but in selected patients, it is absolutely life and even limb saving with a significant reduction in cardiac events. So lipoprotein apheresis is the one thing we have today that's actually LPA specific, but it's not a drug. It is actually a mechanical solution to that problem. So if you have elevated LP little a today, there's a lot we can do. Some of you are waiting to hear about what's coming down the pipeline because you will have heard perhaps if you have elevated LPA that there are clinical trials for dedicated drugs in the pipeline that will specifically lower LP little a. We're gonna do that in part three. We'll talk about the entire pipeline, what the drugs are, what we know so far and what we don't. So the story does not end here. Stay tuned for the next one. Leave any questions down in the comments below. And until next time, take really good care.